All right. Um, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, so this is the session entitled CAR T cell and immunotherapy in lymphoma. And uh, during this session, um, we'll provide an overview of CAR T cell and immunotherapy for lymphoma, what to expect during and after treatment, and really importantly for Canada, access to these therapies in Canada. And so it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Ronan Foley, who will lead this presentation. Uh, Dr. Foley is uh, well known to all of us. He's an academic hematologist with expertise in the management of patients with hematologic malignancies and an expert in the field of CAR T cell therapy and immunotherapy for lymphoma. Um, his uh, current research laboratory activities include immunotherapies such as the development of cancer vaccines. He's an active member of the Institute of Gene Therapeutics uh, with primary emphasis on translational phase one clinical trials. Um, and relevant to today's presentation, he is the site principal investigator, principal investigator of CAR T cell therapy uh, clinical trials at the Jurovinsky uh, Hospital and Cancer Center in Hamilton. Um, so thank you, Dr. Foley, for taking time today to present on this topic to the lymphoma community. We really are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Doug. It's, uh, I must say it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, I want to um, thank Lymphoma Canada for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. And of course, I'd like to thank everybody who's taken the time out today to, to join me in this presentation. Um, I just want to uh, put up a few disclosures of um, either advisory boards or lectures that, uh, that I've received honorarium for. Um, and just to mention that for today, as Doug mentioned, I do, I do want to focus mainly on uh, chimeric antigen receptor therapy uh, in adult patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on at a commercial level. Um, with the uh, Kim Raya or the Novartis product, and also things for patients and caregivers to think about um, after you've gone through this therapy. But I do want to start off with a general statement, which is kind of an exciting thing. And certainly, I would say lymphoma has really been one of the beneficiaries of immunotherapy. And for the longest time, uh, Dr. Stewart would have been one of the people saying it as well. There were many of us who said uh, the immune system has the power to, to treat cancer and has the power to cure cancer. And above and beyond chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, this fourth dimension of immunotherapy was somewhat elusive. Um, but uh, there was, we had knowledge and what you know, we needed to understand the immune system, which is complicated, and understand how to, to manipulate it in ways that are clinically beneficial and not harmful. So you can see here, there is a vast array of strategies to stimulate the immune system to treat patients with cancer and potentially cure patients with cancer. Um, some of these we're familiar with, some of them are coming down the pipe. Uh, but as Doug suggested, uh, CAR T therapy is here and now along with monoclonal antibodies. And I'll just take you back to the granddaddy of them all, which of course is rituximab. And many of you will have had rituximab. Uh, rituximab uh, has been around a while, uh, has had great benefit for in terms of um, outcomes of response rate, PFS, and uh, people survive longer with this drug. So it really has been a winner. The main thing about rituximab was that the toxicity was relatively low, so it was easy to combine with chemotherapy, a strategy we now call chemoimmunotherapy. As I said, there's been major improvements in, in many different lymphomas. Uh, and the fact that we can use it subcutaneously now is uh, providing uh, cost savings and a much easier way to give the drug. Um, but it didn't stop there. We're, we've now looked at uh, next generation monoclonal antibodies that in this case, uh, uh, targeting a type two uh, glycoengineered product with a FC region, that region on the bottom 
that is better at engaging the immune system. So keep in mind, these antibodies go in, they're very precise, they bind specifically to a target on a tumor cell, but then their presence tells the immune system to come in and, and get to work to kill that cancer cell. And of course, abinutuzumab has proven itself in CLL and for patients that are, are refractory to rituxan with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this um, is somewhat of an older concept, but it may be making a comeback. Uh, this is now where we think about antibodies, but now they have uh, what we call a payload attached to them. So there's, a, there's, there's not just the antibody binding and bringing in the immune, immune system, but there's now actually uh, the ability to kill cells and cells in the, in the vicinity uh, through radiation that's attached to the antibody. And so two drugs, uh, Bexar and Zevalin, um, struggled a bit just out of the practical issues of administering these drugs, but they are still around and potentially making a comeback. So that's Bexar and Zevalin, keep that in mind. The other strategy is to attach chemotherapy to a monoclonal antibody. And in this way, very much like a Trojan horse, the antibody goes in, it's very specific, it binds to CD30, but there is um, a chemotherapy drug attached to it that kind of gets, sneaks into the cell through liposomal um, mechanisms, but then once inside the, the cell, will put the cell into cell arrest and eventually the cell will die. And of course, this drug, Brintuximab, I can tell you there are four major trials, Echelon 1, Echelon 2, Athera, and Alcanza, all big studies where, where this drug has really proven uh, clinical benefits. So, so this is, uh, has also been a winner. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but the concept of immune checkpoint in cancer in general and in a lot of solid malignancies has really taken off. And uh, the idea here is very simply put is that tumors have markers on their surface that when immune cells show up to do their business, so the immune cell knows it's a cancer cell, it knows it should, should it clear that cell, but essentially that T cell is put to sleep these factors kind of put the whammy on the T cell and, and, and it just either doesn't kill or, or goes to sleep. And if you can block, block those inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, that will allow the T cell to go and finish its job. And so there are drugs, nivolumumab and pem pembrolizumab, which are well established in Hodgkin lymphoma uh, and have proven and are now becoming standard of, of uh, treatment. In non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the data is less impressive, but there are some positives in primary and mediastinal B-cell lymphoma and some of the T and NK cell lymphoma subtypes. So these checkpoint inhibitors um, uh, are evolving and with tremendous promise. The last one I'll talk about before we go into CAR-T is something called BITES. And so you might remember it that way. But what a bite is, is a way of bringing a T cell to a tumor cell. So the T cell has this amazing ability to, to kill cancer cells, but sometimes it needs a little bit of help in finding where it needs to be. And so these bite or bi-specific T cell engagers, part of them recognizes the tumor cell and the other part recognizes the T cell and they're kind of pulled together uh, in a tug of war and then uh, the T cell uh, will kill the tumor cell from there. And it all sounds a little bit, um, you know, theoretical, but what I can tell you is this is exactly what this drug blinatumumab uh, does. It's a bispecific T cell engager. It's being used in um, patients with lymphoblastic uh, leukemia, but it's also uh, has a high level excellent preliminary data in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is another one to keep an eye on. And more coming. So really there has been uh, uh, a massive expansion in these targeting bites, uh, which are, as you can see, are, are in phase one trials in both CLL and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
Again, all of these drugs are very much targeting the immune system um, for therapeutic benefit. Okay. So, I mean, somewhat topical in, in today with, unfortunately, with COVID, but I want folks to think about T lymphocytes. And when you look at your blood counts, if you look down the list into the differential, you will see something called absolute lymphs. Most of these are, are T cells. And uh, so the T cells exist. And despite treatments you may have had, they remain quite healthy and with this great potential. So in this picture here, we see a cell that's been infected with a virus. And then there's a T cell that is recognizing something about that virus. And it is uh, then excited, it expands, it uh, involves some cytokines, uh, but basically the, this uh, population of T cells can grow to massive numbers um, and go with hand-to-hand -hand combat. In other words, that T cell will bind the infected cell and kill it. Uh, some of the T cells will go on to become what's called memory cells. So it's the, the importance is that your T lymphocytes, your immune cells of your immune system can expand and persist. And so the question is, well, look, if this works for virus infections, why can't we do this against cancer cells? And so that's where uh, this field took off. Now, it's a little bit complicated. I, I, I apologize, but I, I would say that we have on the top a tumor cell and below it a T lymphocyte, one of your T lymphocytes. And normally a T lymphocyte could recognize a tumor cell, but it has a rather complicated receptor. And the, the many conditions have to be correct for this thing to fire off. But once it fires off, it will send a message inside telling that T cell to attack the tumor cell. And what I can tell you is these T lymphocytes are very powerful, very powerful. And if you've ever uh, encountered somebody who's suffering something called graft versus host disease, you will know that this attack of these T cells can be relentless and very powerful. Now, this is complicated, but this is what CAR T is here on the right. Basically, you take T cells, you genetically modify them to express a single uh, um, receptor that binds to the tumor cell, much like a monoclonal antibody. But this is much more simple. These cells roll around with this single CART construct. And as soon as it binds the tumor cell, it sets off a reaction below that turns on the T cell and off it goes and kills. So remember, CAR T cells are much uh, simple. They're not as elegant as the tumor, as the natural T cell receptor, which has checks and balances. These things are either on or off. And of course, that sometimes is problematic if the, the reaction is too strong, too fast, too powerful. Now, uh, again, um, in Canada, we're now uh, fortunate to have three different types of CAR T cells. Um, and uh, so um, one is from, from Novartis, another from Gilead, and another from uh, BMS. So all these products are out there. Uh, the receptor is the same. Uh, it's a receptor against CD19, FMC63. But I was alluding to this before, the, the, um, the kind of guts of these things really lies in the red. And the red is something called co-stimulatory signals. And these co-stimulatory signals are really what set these things off like a firework to, to be activated and, and kill the tumor cells. And uh, so the co-stimulatory is incredibly important. Uh, and, and just to mention, uh, coming down the, the pipe are many new types of CAR T cells. So this is, this is an industry that's exploding uh, with different ways of using this very powerful system that turns out to be extremely good at killing lymphoma cells, non-Hodgkin lymphoma cells. Now, the way it works is you have your own T lymphocyte, your own white blood cell. 
and then you have a tumor cell. And the problem is this, your own T cell doesn't really fully recognize the tumor cell and kind of just swims by it. So what you have to do is you need to genetically modify that T cell right into the DNA. You, you put new DNA so that that T cell now can express this car, this thing I showed you, the simple uh, si uh, uh, single chain antibody. Now, this, when, now that this T cell is loaded up, expressing all these cars, it doesn't swim by anymore. It sees the tumor cell and it kills it hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, combat through, it releases certain um, chemicals and kills the tumor cell on site. But it's not just that. That CAR T cell in the process of killing will expand and expand and expand uh, to many, many, many more cells uh, that go off and kill. So in that regard, this whole system becomes a living drug. These genetically modified, your own genetically modified T cells are now in your body, but they're planted like a seed, but they grow to huge numbers. Now, when that happens, again, as I mentioned, if it's too fast, too hard, there will be release of cytokines and if this becomes overwhelming, sometimes you have to tap on the brakes and try and cool it off because it can actually make you quite sick. It's a, a, a hyperimmune process uh, that, that goes on. But there's two things I'd say about this therapy that's very exciting. Uh, one is um, here, here we see a patient and this is something called a PET scan. Some of you may have had PET scans before. I don't know if you ever looked at them, but basically, whatever is black is lymphoma. Now, um, there are certain things that we expect, the, 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 the bladder and, and some parts of the body are, are normally black, but you can see between the left and the right, uh, a big difference. And, and what the difference was, this person had a single injection of CAR T cells, and one month later, we look again, and they're in complete remission. There's no longer any tumor. And this is, this is a patient who'd had seven prior therapies, lots of chemotherapy, and also a patient that had medical problems. Uh, the ECOG performance status of three means they're, they're, they're not well. Uh, the heart function was 45% and there'd been other medical problems. But despite all that, it's uh, a winning situation uh, for this patient. And moreover, and what... I find it very uh, exciting is that patients who go through this therapy and those that do get into remission, sustainable remission, their quality of life uh, improves significantly over the next um, um, six to 18 months. So there are some therapies we do that, uh, you know, they, they lead, you know, and uh, an allogeneic transplant is an example where you can have lingering side effects. But for the most part, after about six months after this therapy, your quality of life improves. And of course it improves because now you're in remission and you're not suffering from the lymphoma specific symptoms. So that uh, is obviously a positive thing. I'm just gonna move along here. So um, Doug alluded to this a little bit before, but uh, uh, being able to provide CAR T therapy does require your local institution, the hospital where you're being treated, to go through a site certification. And uh, it, it is a detailed, uh, uh, comprehensive process uh, to be a center that uh, can be qualified uh, to do this to do this therapy. And there's many, many moving pieces. And just looking at the timeline, you can see. Um, the steps, but also just appreciate how long it takes from start to finish. And so this, is, this has been our timeline, but it's absolutely critical that we get more centers across the country uh, uh, able to do this therapy, extremely important. And this kind of complicated slide does kind of um, uh, explain the patient journey and the patient journey includes uh, identification, uh, consultation, collecting your uh, lymphocytes, sending them off to be manufactured, uh, some lymphodepleting care therapy to make room for the new ones, your infusion day, and then 
careful day-to-day -day monitoring for 30 days and then, and then beyond. So there's lots of moving pieces. Centers need to kind of, it's, it takes a team to pull everybody together. Uh, you know, really there's, there's no chiefs, everybody's playing a role. <clears throat> you, you need to have a lot of education, uh, but you also, the, the hospital needs to, at an institutional level, uh, have uh, agreements and uh, MOUs and confidentiality. So it is a complicated process, but, uh, we, we certainly uh, support and uh, try to think of ways to help centers uh, to get this going. Now, just to say something about diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I don't want to go into too much detail, but as we all know, RCHOP is the mainstay and RCHOP works very well in 60 to 70% of cases. Those that either relapse or progress may go on to a stem cell transplant, but for those who uh, either have refractory or di progressive disease after transplant, there's limited options. And so this is where CAR-T comes in for those patients. And we now have a Health Canada indication uh, to be able to provide CAR-T therapy um, for patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, and uh, primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. We also can treat patients three to 25 years of age with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So these have been approved through Health Canada and then the provinces look to sort out how to fund them. When we take a referral from uh, outside, and so we're accepting referrals, um, we, uh, uh, a referral package needs to be put together and we're kind of hoping to have most of the studies or most of the eligibility parts of this done locally so that when a person arrives, we can move the patient along quickly. What I can tell you is speed wins in this, um, in this system. We want to get on with the treatments as soon as possible. These lymphomas are often highly unstable. They're hard to keep a uh, lid on the boiling water. And so we really want to just maximize uh, the speed that we can, we can get the CAR T cells into the patient. Um, there are some things to think about in CAR T therapy. Sometimes while the cells are being manufactured, they go off to New Jersey. They're there for 22 to 26 days. We may have to give some chemotherapy again, just to keep things under control. Uh, when we're seeing people, we're constantly thinking about how much lymphoma is there. Uh, we'd like the lymphoma to be the, the lower amount as possible, but of course, sometimes it's not. And another marker that uh, people look at called the LDH tells us a bit, little bit about how aggressive it is. Uh, when we see people, we sort of have a cutoff of an ECOG performance of two. That means you're out of bed at least half of the day. We look at uh, some specialized blood tests that you may not be familiar with, but these are inflammatory markers. We look at your lymphocytes and we're all always sort of doing an assessment of your medical comorbidities. Do you have heart failure? Do you have kidney disease? Do you have COPD and how that factors in? So the decision to go to CART uh, is, is, a, um, is a blend of things you're looking at uh, to go forward. Um, the questions that we face are, you know, should you try to reduce the burden of the tumor? Um, and my personal belief is CAR T cell therapy referrals should be made at the first sign of disease recurrence or progression before salvage chemotherapy. Uh, I'm constantly thinking about the patient's ECOG status, bleeding, cardiac, and a little bit concerned that if you have an autoimmune disease, could that be made worse by these T cells? What we set up for patients who are referred and come to, to Hamilton is a, what we call a one-stop shopping cart. And so this is basically in a single day, you show up, you're assessed by a nurse practitioner, a physician, a social worker, and a pharmacist. And the reason for all this is there's the medical aspects we talked about, but the social worker uh, and understanding how, how it's going to work, because you may have to move into our area, stay in a hotel for four to six weeks. And so what actually turns out to be very important for people doing CAR-T is do they have a dedicated caregiver that can be a nurse, a driver, a pharmacist,
take on all these roles. So that's a critical thing. So we assess that all in the first day. And by the end of the day, we'll make a decision about going forward with CAR-T and we'll submit the paperwork uh, to get your funding that day. Now, this is a complicated slide, but this is the concept here is when you, when you arrive to have your white blood cells collected, and that's done by a process called leukophoresis, and some of you will be familiar with that from collecting stem cells. It's basically the same process. But we want your white blood cells to be in the best, most excellent shape they can possibly be in. And so in order to provide that, there's a list that the, um, uh, the nursing staff will go through to make sure your lymphocytes haven't been affected by any of these drugs. So you can see it's a big, long list. But just to be aware that um, uh, that's an important thing. The biggest thing to take note of is this, is that you cannot have any steroids for 72 hours prior to collection. Steroids actually have a negative effect on, on lymphocytes. Uh, they, they can kill them. And uh, so, so no steroids. And so the problem is some people who are coming for CAR T therapy have been on steroids to kind of keep things under control. And then when you stop them, it can be, it can be a, a bit concerning or, or things can become more unstable. So that's something that uh, we sort of have to be careful. That 72 hours prior to leukophoresis becomes a critical time in a patient's care. Now, these are patients we've treated with CAR-T at our center. And look, I mean, it really is all about these lymphocytes. I mean, that is what's gonna perform. That's what's going to make you better. And you can see over time, this is a graph looking at the number of CD3 cells that we've collected over time. We at Jurovinsky have learned that the best products are the ones with higher lymphocyte counts. So while Novartis says one times 10 to the ninth is enough, and actually we're shooting for four. And, and that really is what gives us consistently good products. Um, and so the CD3 percent per batch, again, we have come to learn and I think in identifying patients, those with really lots of healthy T lymphocytes end up doing much better. Um, th these are just, again, going the other way prior to the infusion of your product once it comes back from New Jersey. Again, some rules about what, whatever you've been getting in the meantime while you're waiting, the rules about when to stop, and of course the steroids again at 72 hours. We're doing CAR-T in Hamilton as an outpatient. In other words, once you've had your infusion of cells, you go home. And uh, the pharmacist plays an extremely important role here in giving you medications to, uh, to take while you're at home. You will be coming to the ODS every day for a detailed assessment, but while you're at home, you'll have nausea pills, you'll be on a cyclovir to prevent shingles, fluconazole to prevent fungus infections, septra to pre prevent uh, uh, pulmonary infections, and you will actually be on an anti-seizure drug uh, called Keppra. And the reason for that is we know, despite all the um, uh, benefits with CAR-T, that there are safety events or there are side effects that we have to have an eagle eye for and catch them early. And in the first eight weeks of the first two months, cytokine release syndrome and neurologic events called ICANs are really the big things on the radar. After that, having low counts, opportunistic infections uh, are, are what we're looking at. So what is CRS? So cytokine release syndrome uh, is something that happens very quickly. So within a few days of receiving your CAR-Ts, and this relates to that massive expansion, they go in and they say about a thousand, uh, about um, each CAR-T cell can kill about a thousand, thousand tumor cells, but they're growing and they're expanding. And so it starts with a fever, but then it transitions to your blood pressure dropping. And then it transitions to you becoming short of breath or troubled breathing. And then you start to see organ injury and, and eventually delirium. 
And there are some blood markers. Uh, we use something called the CRP, which is a surrogate for IL-6, and the ferritin that go up incredibly as you enter this hyperinflammatory state. Fortunately, there is an antidote with a drug called tocilizumab, but that's, this is why it's incredibly important you're at a center that knows what they're doing and that if you get sick, you come to a center that has tocilizumab. So what, as soon as we see someone meets criteria, we want to make sure the drug can be given within 45 minutes of a call to the pharmacy 24 hours a day. Sometimes you, if the patient gets sick enough, you have to commit to using dexamethasone, but that is going to start to directly affect some of the CAR T cells. And, uh, and sometimes you're, you're concerned about doing that. The other one that happens, and often these things happen together, is neurotoxicity, something called ICANS. And this starts off with a little bit of confusion. It's sometimes very subtle. And often the caregiver will say, you know, my, my spouse isn't quite right. They're just not saying things. Then they can become aphasic. They literally stop speaking. Uh, they can become um, unresponsive. They can go on to have seizure and they can go on to have swelling of the brain. So, so this is major stuff here, obviously. And so that's why patients really need to be uh, monitored uh, uh, in a very uh, significant way uh, to catch these things early on. Uh, as I said, patients will already be on a seizure drug, but uh, when you start getting into grade two or four, you may have to bail out and give dexamethasone, and then sometimes you have to actually give uh, high doses of, of solumedrol. But of course, at some point, uh, both with CRS or with neurotoxicity, you will be taken to the ICU for, for further care. So very important things. There's some guidelines um, for after therapy. Um, if your white blood cell count is low, um, sometimes from the lymphodepleting therapy, you may need grastafil or, or neupogen. Uh, we are using antibacterial prophylaxis, so patients are staying on uh, levofloxacin. We are using uh, a cyclovir, in our case, 400 milligrams twice a day. We give septra. We are using uh, antifungal until the neutrophils get above one. And we're also using IV um, uh, uh, gamma globulin. We're using home sub-Q gamma globulin to patients afterwards. So it's, there's a fair bit at the back end of this that patients have to uh, continue to have for at least six months after therapy. Um, so these cytopenias, your counts will remain, remain low, even though you're now in remission or your PET scan's negative, but we do have to watch for infections, which have become a bit of an Achilles heel for this treatment down the road. Now, what has been exciting about CAR T therapy is that patients have uh, remained in remission now for, for over three years. Um, and uh, those cells have persisted. And so for patients who achieve a remission at three or six months, uh, they are remarkably durable. They, they still are in remission uh, up to three years later and, and we're still following that group. Uh, so, so that's a very important thing. The um, CR rates are about 40%. So it's an important thing to keep in mind that uh, not everybody's going into remission, but hopefully as we choose patients and we really are able to select them, that number's gonna go up. And uh, moreover, we're realizing that there are things we can combine with CAR-T to increase that uh, complete response. But certainly for, for patients who previously really had not much in the way of therapy, 40% is, is, is quite exciting. Uh, what we've also learned in the real world, and so CIBMTR is what we see in the real world, is those nasty side effects that I described, grade three CRS, is only about 4% and that neurotoxicity 5%. So although they were much higher in the trials, in the real world, I think people are learning how to manage these things, and so the outcomes are much better. Uh, one of the things just uh, to be aware of, and I think a patient can advocate for this, is we don't want to sort of be giving people corticosteroids and, and can't imagine how hard it is to stop people from getting steroids 
his steroids are kind of used like water in, in myeloma and in, in lymphoma, but, but you almost need to have an armband saying uh, no steroids. And then where's the growth? So right now it's diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but mantle cell lymphoma is coming, follicular is coming, and CLL is coming. So these are things in the close future. Now, just to um, uh, look to the future, and I guess we're in the last slot here, uh, thinking about the future. So, you know, one of the things you, uh, you could sort of see is it, it's, it's a journey that a patient goes on and it, it takes a while. It probably takes about two months start to finish to get your CAR T cells. And that's because patient cells have to be individually collected and processed. And for some lymphomas, they just won't behave for that two months and patients get into trouble. So we really have to think to the future and, and, and in Canada, you know, can we improve the automation and the yield and the reproducibility? Right now, cells go to central uh, production facilities, one in New Jersey, another one in, in Los Angeles. Um, but can we have decentralized man manufacturing? Could one of our hospitals become a manufacturing site to reduce the turnaround times and the cost of shipping? The other big one is, can we start to use allogeneic CAR T cells? What that means is these are T lymphocytes from somebody else, a donor uh, that has donated these cells. They're kept on the shelf and uh, literally are taken down from the shelf and given to the patient almost immediately. That is a very um, exciting, uh, appealing idea. However, whenever we give somebody else's cells to you, there's always a risk that those T cells will recognize they're not at their home and could cause graft versus host disease, which would be somewhat of a step backwards. And then finally, the DNA transfer, because this is gene therapy, there may be other ways to get genes into cells. So these are some immediate things that we're thinking about. And what I can tell you is there is another cell, right now it's been T lymphocytes, but there is another cell that's coming crashing into the field called an NK cell. And so these NK cells are similar to T cells, but they're different. And uh, what makes them appealing as an off the shelf product is you can take some cord blood, that uh, the cord from uh, a baby when a baby's born, some of that cord blood can be used to make the expand these NK cells. You can make them into CAR T cells. They have very lower absent graft versus host disease. And they actually kill in two ways. So you get a double benefit from these NK CAR T cells. And I believe Takeda is starting a trial looking at uh, CD19 directed uh, NK CAR Ts. Now, CRISPR is uh, now we're really getting into the nitty gritty of things you can do. But if you are using T cells, you can now go right into the DNA, the double helix and you can start to knock out things that you don't want, the things that would cause side effects for the patient. And so you can knock out PD-1 or the T cell receptor with this CRISPR engineered T cells. You can essentially make these cells into anything you want and you can make them into very powerful killer cells uh, that will uh, go in and do what we're, what we're seeing with the CAR T cells. And then if you really want to take it to the future, uh, you, can, you can take a human pluripotent stem cell that could come from your skin and you can modify it into a, um, um, an intermediate uh, stem cell that you can then use to grow cells. You can grow NK cells, you can grow T cells, uh, you can expand them and you can use CRISPR so we can readily, readily modify these cells. We can add factors, remove factors. So this is getting pretty sci-fi, but the technology is there and it's kind of being looked at. But again, you could take a little biopsy of your skin and, and grow this powerful uh, population of uh, tumor fighting uh, cells that do even a better job. So uh, a little bit into the future, but um, uh, a very powerful uh, potential. 
So I'm going to um, finish up here. Uh, I, I will say without question, not even a maybe, uh, limp, uh, immunotherapy is rapidly changing the landscape of cancer therapy and is very much changing the landscape of patients with, with both non-Hodgkin's and, and Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, it's proved itself with the monoclonal antibodies, but now it's proving itself with the uh, T-lymphocyte directed therapies. These cell-based therapies are now emerging in the clinic and across Canada. I think we need to step on the gas and get more centers opened up so that this becomes available to Canadian patients. And hopefully that they don't have to travel too far to, to get this therapy and lives aren't disrupted. Um, I think we need to scale up. Uh, and I, I, you know, I do see that these off-the-shelf products I was alluding to, you have to be very careful in the, in the clinical trials to prove they're safe, but I see them coming. And, uh, you know, modifications of current successful approaches uh, have created this new modality of cancer and the sky's the limit as to where this immunotherapy is going to go. Right now, we're treating people after multiple therapies, but conceivably, if you treat them, perhaps this will become the first line of therapy. And instead of chemotherapy, we're moving right to immunotherapy. Um, we may even see better data. So I predict big changes. Um, and there's no doubt that, that immunotherapy is here to stay and uh, things are gonna rapidly change over the next 10 years. So it's promising, I'm excited. I know Dr. Stewart's excited, excited and I, I hope um, uh, that um, folks out there uh, are also um, excited about immunotherapy. Thank you very much. Well, thanks uh, so much, uh, Ronan. That was fantastic. A great overview of a really complicated topic. Um, I think we have some time for questions and there's a lot coming through. Um, so kind of rapid fire, <laughs> uh, kind of group them. So one relates to the toxicity issues. So currently, what would you tell people is the percent risk of dying of the treatment, percent risk of needing ICU, and then say if a person from Calgary goes to Hamilton for the treatment, how long do they have to stay there after treatment while you monitor for these complications? Yeah, so uh, the first question is, you know, percentages. Now, uh, it's a very good question. Um, we, there are some patients where I can predict ahead of time and by, by four things, the LDH, the bulk, their ECOG, and the dose of cells I'm giving. And that, you put them together, I can predict, I think you're going to have some trouble with CRS, and I can modify my treatment strategy. I may say, I don't want you as an outpatient, I want you to stay in, and we're going to watch you like a hawk. Uh, the second thing is that with early, earlier interventions, um, I think we've reduced these serious side effects down less than 5%. So in our last 12 patients, nobody's gone to the ICU. So it, it was, it was a, a concern. It remains a concern, but it, ha it doesn't happen very often. Um, and the, the, the next question about uh, how long. So, so we are right now committed to watching people for 30 days after CAR T infusion. Uh, they originally for day one to 10, they come every day, but then 10 to 30, they're coming two or three times a week. Uh, in Hamilton, patients are set up in a hotel unless they get admitted. And so it's a stay bridge. Uh, it's covered by CCO and uh, it really is kind of sorting out the logistics of coming back and forth. You know, we're still very careful about it. If you get a fever or any sort of sign that something might be starting, we get you right back into hospital as an inpatient. Uh, obviously the capacity for ICU beds uh, with COVID has, has become an issue, but we absolutely make sure that, you know, we're not going to be in a situation where, where you can't get all the proper care that you need. Okay. Um, kind of grouping another um, uh, set of questions is related to eligibility. So, so what are the eligibility? Why might, might you not be eligible um, for CAR T cell therapy? Uh, if you had COPD, could you have CAR T cell therapy? 
Yeah, no. So that's that's a terrific question, and, and it's a question we struggle with. So I don't I I don't know if I know the answer exactly. There are uh, some stipulations that this that CCO has put. In other words, your oxygen saturation has to be over ninety two percent. Your heart uh, function has to be greater than forty percent. Um, and so there's some medical things. Um, there is no age limit. Um, and how, on the other hand, you know, I want to be sure in my own heart that if somebody does get into serious side effects, that they can survive them. And so there is, there is kind of a, a red line, so to put it, uh, to put it, but, uh, it's certainly we're seeing people that were not, would not have been eligible for an autologous transplant, but are eligible for, for CAR T. My little sort of way I look at it is if you can tolerate GDP, you can tolerate CAR-T. So that's... Great. Um, another uh, group of questions was uh, related to experience. So how many have you done in Hamilton? Uh, what's the country that's done the most? Um, do Canadians have to go to the States or how many centers in Canada do it? Yeah, so just four centers in Canada, but I believe another four or six are on the verge of opening up. And, and uh, the questioner is absolutely correct. It really gets down to that journey that the institution takes to become fully certified. Uh, and, it, and it's an onerous process. You, you need to sort of be audited. You need to have all the books set up. Everybody has to be educated so that if somebody bounces into eMERGE, the eMERGE people exactly know what to do. The ICU people know what to do. So it's, it's, it's difficult to set the table, but you absolutely have to set the table uh, for, for safety. Only four centers right now. I think it, it goes province to province. Some provinces are saying, well, you, you, you can go to the United States to have this therapy. But obviously, our goal is to have this all in Canadian soil. So, you know, I think it's a hardcore press to, to kind of get this therapy up and going here so people don't have to go to the U.S. That said, failing any other option, you know, God bless, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity to get the therapy that way. Um, so how many, how many have you actually done in Hamilton? Oh, yeah, 26. Oh, okay. And uh, are there reports of other late long-term toxicity side effects other than cytopenias and low antibody levels? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, so, so patients do receive treatment called lymphodepleting. And, and really what that is, you want to create room for these new genetically modified uh, lymphocytes to come in. So you kind of want to kill off some of the older lymphocytes to make room. And we do that with uh, a drug called fludarabine. And, you know, I think it's the fludarabine that really contributes to the prolonged cytopenias, but there is a risk with fludarabine and potentially the other chemotherapy you had of developing MDS. So that's always on my mind with patients, especially some of the older patients who've seen a lot of chemotherapy. And I will often do a bone marrow to make sure they don't have MDS uh, going into this therapy prior to the, to the fludarabine. So we do think about secondary malignancies. It's on the list. And, and part of that for me is, is uh, myelodysplastic syndrome uh, to keep an eye on. Um, uh, quick one, has COVID affected CAR T cell therapy? I mean, I have to say, yeah, I, I, I believe so. And, and, and perhaps in ways I'm not even aware of. Um, you know, would there be more referrals coming our way in the absence of COVID? Are people sort of reluctant to think about traveling uh, to, to Hamilton? I mean, fortunately, Hamilton, we've been quite, quite protected in terms of numbers of COVID. The second thing is, you know, there's aggressive screening for, co for COVID multiple steps along the way where you get a COVID test, you get a COVID test, you get a COVID test, so that we're sure you're not, in, not sort of fighting two battles. Um, uh, but, but no, it, we, you know, these, these are often uh, life or death situations for patients. So, so our commitment is to push on as safely as possible. Great. And maybe the last question, uh, or questions, several. So what would it take for this to be frontline therapy? Um, are, and are people doing kind of cost-effective analyses to say, 
would you save money from a from doing this frontline versus later by avoiding all these other treatments? But what would it take for that to happen? Yeah. So you know, Doug, as 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 you know, it's it's a bit of a dilemma because our shop is is certainly much cheaper. I, I would I I would tell you that this therapy is about the price of two Lamborghinis. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but you know, um, new, new ones, right? New ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, you know, we've done well with our shop, right? I mean, uh, you know, you can, you cure a lot of probably more than half the people with, with our shop. Admittedly, there's toxicities, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I, I do, I do envision this moving up. And I guess the question is, you know, when are we going to see auto stem cell transplant versus CAR T head to head? Um, and, um, I also know that the same story is happening with multiple myeloma and we're participating in a trial cartitude five, that is CAR T up front in multiple myeloma. So, so for sure it's coming up. Um, and, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, does it supplant, uh, our chop for, for straight up uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, hard to know. Yeah, so I think part of that answer is we do need the phase three clinical trial, right? So yeah. We can't make assumptions. 